Welcome to the Communication Diva Podcast, Episode 122. Today on the podcast, Part 1 of a two-part series. Part 1 is called The Importance of Listening. Tune in next week for Part 2, called The Importance of Deciding Whether or Not to Take the Speaker Seriously. Hello and welcome to the show. I'm Jen Swanson and I'm so pleased you've joined me today on the Communication Diva podcast. It's Holy Week, Easter week, which for me as a pastor is one of the busiest weeks of the entire year. And so it's rather nice to be taking a break from getting ready for church services and to be spending a little bit of time with you. Some of you know I've been producing this show since 2011. In fact, I think the very first show I did might have been in 2010, but it's it's a long time back. And way back in episode two, I published uh, an episode called 10 Minutes to Better Listening, and that is one of my most popular episodes. So six years later or so, I've decided to revisit the topic and hopefully add some new information and share a little bit more with you about the value and the importance of listening. Before I jump into that, it is April 13th when I'm recording this show and my spring forward sale is on the uh, Resume Secrets Plus course over at courses.communicationdiva.com and that sale is almost over. It ends April 25th, 2017. So if you need a resume or you know someone who does and you use the promo code, all capital letters, all one word, spring forward, you will get 41% off the fairly popular video course that will help you get your resume in top shape. Um, So this offering also includes a personal resume review by me, and the prices are going up after this offer closes. So if you want to get in on this deal, and if you want to get it for yourself or as a gift for someone else, you have about 12 days from the publication of this episode left to do so. All right, so listening. Listening is not the same thing as hearing. We hear things all the time, and studies have shown that we only retain anywhere between 17 and 25% of what it is we hear. Well, given that we are bombarded with sounds from the minute we wake up to the moment we fall asleep, that's a pretty good percentage, I think. I hear the birds singing every morning while I sit having my coffee, uh, my wake-up ritual of, of sitting there with my coffee in the living room and watching, well, in the winter in the living room, in the summer I'm out on my deck, but watching the world wake up and listening to the birds sing. We often have our national radio program, the, the CBC, Canadian Broadcast Corporation, on to hear what's happening in the world. And I might take in a podcast or, you know, Uh, listen to um, something on YouTube. The music is blaring and the trainer is shouting and the bells are ringing every 15 seconds at my kickboxing gym. And, uh, And driving, even getting there and back involves sounds. And none of these things that I'm talking about involve conversation and what I have to do for work. So we hear all sorts, like hundreds, probably thousands of sounds a day. And some of them we're not even aware of in, uh, in our daily activity. Most of us like to think we are good or even great communicators, but one of the skills we have the least amount of actual training in is listening. Now, because of the work I do, including the coaching and as a minister who does counseling and pastoral care, I have had formal training in listening skills. But when I taught communication skills to healthcare students, healthcare worker students, for most of them, and some of them were not young, some of them were, and some of them, this was a second or third career, uh, for most of them, this was a brand new thing, learning how to listen well. So why is it important and what advantages can you gain by getting better at listening? What's in it for you to learn more about this topic and to practice it? And how can you go about getting better at the skill of listening? Well, first of all, if you're interested in building professional relationships in your workplace, listening is a key skill. 
Whether you are one of the, the masses of workers or, or you're in management or you're in leadership or, or maybe you're looking for a job or you're striking out on your own as a freelancer or an entrepreneur, listening is one skill well, well worth taking some time to improve. And honestly, it won't cost you anything but time. You can practice on unsuspecting people wherever you go. There is no end to the opportunities to work on improving this skill. Listening well does a lot of things. Listening well will reduce conflict. You can learn all sorts of new things by listening well. You can improve your your education and your knowledge base. Listening can improve your self-esteem. It can reduce stress if you are listening and understanding what it is that you are hearing. You can improve your interpersonal relationships by listening well. Listening can bring you new opportunities. You you might actually get some great advice or hear other perspectives and new perspectives, things that you hadn't thought about before. You might broaden your horizons, to use an old cliche. (laughs) Good listening will increase your productivity. It will improve your customer service and your client satisfaction which is really good for business. You can improve your business this way. Listening will deepen relationships and connection with others and not just in the workplace. Listening effectively can reduce errors. It can save costly mistakes. And in some cases, it can even improve safety. Good listening can solve problems. It can earn you respect. And it can make you a far better leader and more successful as a business person or as as uh, a career person. I could go on and on. Honestly, there are so many benefits to improving this skill that it's a real shame that, that there are people who won't take the time to do it. Listening to someone else is actually a gift you are giving them, and I really believe that. Have you ever been around someone who talks incessantly about themselves and never stops to ask you how you are doing or what is going on in your life? There are some people who love to hear themselves speak, and by doing so all the time, they don't invite others into the conversation. And I don't know about you, but I find that exhausting. I have spent time with friends at a dinner party where one person dominated the conversation for the entire evening, saying the same things over and over again, but just in new and different ways. And I tell you, by the end of the night, I realized I had barely spoken at all. And there were, you know, half a dozen people at this thing. And and I'm an extrovert. And I'm one who likes to talk, as you can tell. And so I found that rather amazing, that I had said about five words all night. And, uh, and this one person had taken over the entire evening and was basically holding court for the whole evening. And... Um, And, you know, the hospitality was amazing. The food and the wine were plentiful. But I felt like I had attended a one-person performance. And and there, there seems to be a lot of that around. There are a lot of people that are really happy to launch in and talk about themselves, but who are not giving you the gift of listening back in return. It's not reciprocal with these people, which is unfortunate. Being listened to is becoming more and more rare. One of the things that I sometimes do in a workshop or when leading a retreat is I give the participants an activity and I pair them up and I invite them to go for a walk. And the rules are that uh, they'll walk for five or ten minutes or, or depending on how long I want to send them off. And one person will talk for that entire five or ten minutes Um, while the other person listens only. There's no commentary allowed, no questions, no response other than eye contact or nodding or smiling or uh uh-huh, you know, a little bit of encouragement. And then when they come to the end of the allotted time, or maybe it's a landmark that I send them off to, you know, walk walk down to the end of that dike, and when you get to the end of the pier, turn around and come back, right? So when they get to the end of their allotted time or their landmark, they switch. And the other person listens for the entire time. And the person who had been listening, who was silent, does the speaking. And often I'll give them a, uh, a topic to, to start off. You know, what, what are your hopes for next summer or something like that. And uh, give them a subject to start off on because some people find it daunting, especially if they're introverts, to have to speak for that length of time 
on their own. But it, it's just two people. And, uh, and then what I do is gather all of the group back into a circle and debrief the experience. So most people, especially the introverts, once they get over having to talk about themselves or their lives or for what feels like a really long stretch of time, have a lot to say about how it felt being listened to that intently. And words that come up often are that it was an honor or that they felt grateful, or somehow that it was really special to be listened to with that amount of care and attention. So it it is a gift. It is a gift to listen to other people and a gift that we are not often afforded. So if good listening has so many benefits for both ourselves and for those who are we, we are listening to, why don't we do it better and why don't we do it more often? Well, there are a few things that can get in the way of good and effective listening. So here are some things that might be barriers. It takes work. It is tiring. Concentrating solely on what one person is saying and really doing nothing else, not getting distracted by things happening around you or by your own inner thoughts and feelings, which can be even more distracting than stuff going on around you. Well, that takes effort. There is no way that a person can listen effectively 100% of the time. It's impossible. When I'm in a coaching session or when I'm doing a pastoral care visit where I'm mostly listening, it takes concentration and focus to be fully present and engaged in the moment uh, in doing what is called active listening. It's tiring. I find sometimes I'm energized by the experience and sometimes I'm exhausted by it. It depends on what else is going on. But to actually be fully present in the moment with another person is work, which, you know, we've got a lot going on. We don't often take the time to do this work. Things like accents and language differences can be barriers as well. It's harder to listen effectively if it's difficult for you to understand what the person is saying because maybe they have an accent that you are not familiar with or perhaps they have a speech problem. Uh, When I worked in the hospital, listening to patients who'd had a stroke or had had some kind of injury or or medical um, issue that affected the mechanism of their speech, their tongue or their mouth or their, their ability to speak, or maybe they have a tube in or something, it can be really hard to have the patience to stay and listen when someone is struggling to speak. People who suffer from stuttering, that can be a challenge to listen effectively. Uh, People who are hard of hearing, that can be a challenge if you're trying to have a conversation. Maybe you're listening in a language that's not your mother tongue and you have to work extra hard to translate in your head. I found that really tiring. If I'm trying to listen and speak to someone in French, um, I find that exhausting because it is not my mother tongue. Although I, I was fairly fluent in it at one time, it is still work to pick up the nuances, the jargon, Uh, the subtleties of a different language. So be aware of that if you're having a conversation with someone who is speaking in a language that is not their first language. It can be a challenge. Um, Listening to unfamiliar jargon can be tedious. Maybe you're, you're listening to someone who's speaking in an industry or a business where they use a lot of terminology and a lot of abbreviations, and maybe there are things that you don't understand, and that can make listening difficult. I had a university professor once who used four or five big fancy academic words when one regular word would have sufficed, meaning that many of her audience felt inadequate and and pretty much just plain stupid because many of us couldn't understand what the heck she was saying, even though she was speaking English. And, you know, she was known for this. And at first I thought, oh my gosh, I'm in way over my head. I don't understand anything she's saying. I mean, I'm picking up every eighth word. And then I need a dictionary to translate the rest of what she's saying. But after speaking with other students, I realized that a lot of people were in the the same boat and were not really fully understanding what she was trying to impart, which was really too bad because she had a lot of things to teach us, a lot of good things to teach us. But when you need a dictionary to decipher every fourth word that she spoke, well, it was it was pretty poor communication. It was counterproductive, and I, I'm I actually wonder if anyone has told her that, because um, you know I'm not I don't consider myself an uneducated person, and I feel that I'm fairly smart. But 
when it when it's exhausting to try and figure out what someone is saying, I wasn't learning very well because uh, she was being too fancy with her words. Uh, listening effectively takes time, and listening properly to someone. Uh, can take time that maybe we don't often offer or prioritize. So that can be a barrier to listening is just not taking the time to do it well. It takes practice and maybe some skills or training to listen effectively. You can learn it yourself though, but it's an ongoing practice. And the first step is self-awareness. So what are some of the things that I am doing or not doing that could be improved upon? What are some of the things that you are doing or not doing that you could improve upon. And you know, not everyone is willing to take that hard look at themselves in the first place or to learn about what good and effective listening is. So good for you. You are here listening right now, which means that you are interested in improving your listening skills and are willing to take a good look at yourself and see what some things are that you can improve. There's always something that we can improve upon in the practice of good communication and the practice of listening in particular. You are way ahead of many others who either don't take the time or don't even think about the idea of improving their listening skills. So way to go. You're already you're already on top of it. So I've talked about the benefits of what good and effective listening are and that it's truly a gift that you can give to both yourself because of all the benefits you'll get from being a better listener and all of the things that you can uh, be of benefit to others by by all the ways you can be a benefit of others to others. Ah, I'll say it again. All the ways you can be of benefit to others by being a really good listener. I've talked about what some of the barriers to good listening might be. So now let's let's look at what steps you can take to become that good and effective listener. So if you're in person, if you're in person, uh, you know, face to face with the other person, then actually face them, turn to them when you're speaking and make eye contact. Don't be looking down at your phone or looking out the window. Make eye contact with them, not in a creepy way, but in a, in a way that indicates that you are listening and that you are paying attention and that you are interested and engaged in what it is they're saying. And eye contact goes an awful long way. If you're on the phone or you're using a computer program like Skype or FaceTime or Zoom or something, have distractions like the TV, uh, you know, TV or uh, your cell phone if you're on the computer or other computer tabs that might be open or, or notifications on your computer. Have all of that turned off so that you can focus on the conversation at hand. Pay attention to your desire to interrupt. And this one's really hard for me. My brain runs a mile a minute and I think up things that I want to ask and often I will jump in and cut the person off, which is really rude and inconsiderate and I'm always working on not doing that and it's an ongoing uh, effort, believe me. (laughs) Uh, so, So pay attention to your desire to jump in and cut someone off. Um... You know, unless they're going on and on and on, you don't get a word in edgewise. You can you can make a motion with your hand or you can say, okay, wait a minute, I need to clarify something. You can stop people for those reasons. But to jump in and talk over them when they're talking means that you're more interested in what you're saying than what they're saying. So pay attention to your desire to interrupt if you don't need to interrupt. Use what we call minimal encouragers, and you probably do those naturally and didn't know they had a fancy name. So if you say things like, "Uh uh-huh, or yes, I see, or "Mm mm-hmm, or good, or yes, or, or, you know, those little, small, short words, nods, smiles, sounds that indicate that you're listening and that you're interested. And these provide the other person with encouragement, with feedback. They let them know that you're hearing them and that you are engaged in what they're saying and that you are acknowledging them. And those, again, are all gifts in themselves. So minimal encouragers are important. Use silence as a tool. And we sometimes feel like the vacuum of silence must always be filled in this noisy, noisy world that we're in. 
But truly, sometimes falling silent or allowing silence in a conversation will bring more forward from the person you're listening to. A well-placed silence can deepen conversation. So just try it. Again, you can practice all of this stuff on unsuspecting people at any time, anywhere you are, and no one will ever know what it is you're doing. So go ahead and try using silence. And uh, it might feel uncomfortable to you at first if you're not someone who's used to silence, but try it. And you might be amazed at how the other person will then want to fill that vacuum and will continue saying what they need to say. Um, Yeah. If you are asking questions for clarification or or you you want to uh, make sure you're understanding what the person is saying, use open-ended ones rather than closed questions. So, So don't ask a question that requires only a yes or a no answer. That's called a closed a closed question. And that will, might make the conversation very short. So instead, ask a question that will draw out more words from the other person. So for example, instead of saying, do you want burgers for dinner tonight, which would involve probably a yes or a no answer, uh, you might say something like, what do you feel like having for dinner tonight? And that requires more from the other person. So so the open-ended one opens up the possibilities and opens up the conversation. Um, so try using open-ended questions if you're asking someone, you know, what, what do you feel about that? Or what are you thinking when you say that? Or I'm curious, uh, how did that come up, etc. Those are all open-ended questions that don't involve just a yes or a no answer. Another thing to do is to listen beyond words. If you are a in person with someone, or even if you're not in person, there is far more communication going on in the exchange than the actual words being used. So if you are in person, pay attention to the non-verbal cues the other person is sending. What are their facial expressions when they're talking? What is going on with their body language while they're speaking? How are they holding their arms? Um, What are they doing with their feet and their hands? Is their skin tone flushed or not? You know, how are they breathing? Are they showing emotion that's not coming through in the words they are using? In uh, the neuro-linguistic programming, the NLP training that I took, all of these signs and signals were far more important to pay attention to than the actual words used because they relay more information. So what about tone of voice? You know, if you can't see the person, you're speaking to them on the phone, you can still learn an awful lot by paying attention to the tone and the inflection and the rate at which they're speaking around the words that they are saying. We call this para-language. Para means around or beside. So everything around or beside the language itself. So you can, you can say the sentence, have a nice day, and you can say it in different ways. You can say, have a nice day, or you can say, have a nice day, or you can say, have a nice day. And all of those were the same words, but they were completely different communications. So words are, are effective and, and good to listen to, but there is far more going on with active listening than just listening to the content or the actual words. There, there, there is much more that goes on in body language and paralanguage and uh, facial expressions, etc., than just the actual words that are chosen. It's the way you say the words that can communicate much more uh, than just the words do themselves. Another thing is to use paraphrasing. Make sure you understand correctly. And, uh, and paraphrasing is actually not just for words. If you notice someone is shaking their head slightly as they speak, you can paraphrase by saying, I notice you don't seem to be agreeing with something I said. Can you tell me what's going on for you? So you don't have to paraphrase just what they say. You can paraphrase the way they say it. Has anyone ever said to you, why did you say it like that? Right? Say they might have called you out on the way you said something, which is a giveaway, right? A dead giveaway that uh, you are saying something else that doesn't match up with your words. There's a, a, a incongruity with the, with the words that you say and the way that you say it. And sometimes people will call us out on that. And that's a good thing. 
So you can paraphrase that. And if you're really paying attention to the other signals and the cues, uh, you might actually find yourself paraphrasing a little less. You might say something like, what I think I heard you say was, and then you say it back in your own words. Uh, You might have heard them incorrectly. So paraphrasing can um, reduce conflict. It can clarify and make sure that the communication between the two of you actually is the communication that is intended. And, and you are letting the other person know that you've really been listening uh, by, by clarifying. You don't have to do it all the time. But to say, I think I'm hearing you say X, you know, and, and it just it's a check-in to make sure that you are both on the same page as far as what the person is saying and what you are receiving as the listener. So it lets, uh, it clarifies miscommunications in the moment. And, and that prevents people leaving and saying, I don't know what just happened there. You know, it, it, it uh, and then it prevents story making when you go away and you make up a story. So good listening involves work because it involves clarification and not allowing miscommunication to happen if at all possible, making sure that you understand the intention not just the words, but all of the things that go around the words as well. So that's a lot of stuff. And there's more, but that's about all the time I have for today, given the the busyness of this week. So remember that all communication is a lifelong practice. And it's not something you can tick a box once and say, I'm an excellent communicator. Because, yeah, you might be an excellent communicator some of the time, but even experts mess up. And so the word diva in my title is definitely tongue-in-cheek. Excellent communication, including excellent listening skills, requires commitment. It requires time and effort and intention. And so if you're serious about gaining all the benefits that come along with being a great listener, then start practicing today. You can do this. You can start right now as soon as you turn off this this, uh, episode and the next conversation that you have, you can take some of these principles and some of these ideas, apply them and see what happens. You can even start with just one. Start with one of the, the, uh, the tips that I've given you today and see what difference it makes in the next conversation that you have. And I bet that if you work your way through these, you'll find that your relationships deepen, that things open up for you, that you become a better listener, that you gain more respect. All sorts of wonderful things will happen uh, when we listen deeply and carefully to one another. So for those of you celebrating Easter, have a blessed one. And for everyone, thank you for listening to the Communication Diva podcast. This is Jen Swanson, and I will talk to you soon.